what we're making final adjustments here. So, I mean, can we go ahead and get started? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody to our in conversation session. Um, this is Jim Cherney and Margaret Price in conversation: the rhetorics of disability and access. Um, my name is Amy Anderson. Um, I just finished up at the University of Kentucky, and um, I'm going to be moderating. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on our two speakers here. Um, Jim Turney is an assistant professor of communication studies at Wayne State in Detroit. His primary area of research is the rhetoric of ableism, particularly as it operates around sport and visibility. He's published articles in the Western Journal of Communication, Disability Studies Quarterly, and Argumentation and Advocacy. Um, he frequently co-authors with Kurt Lindemann of San Diego State University, um, and he's currently working on a book manuscript entitled The Rhetoric of Ableism. Um, he's also writing about the web-based grassroots battling bear campaign that seeks to increase awareness of PTSD. Jim likes to cook and plays goalie for the Ann Arbor Yaks hockey team. Um, <laughs> So Margaret Price is an associate professor of English at Spelman College in Atlanta. She works at the intersections of rhetoric, disability studies, qualitative inquiry, and creative nonfiction. Um, her writing appears in venues that include college composition and communication, um, Hypatia, Across the Disciplines, Profession, and Bitch, Feminist Response to Pop Culture. Her book, Mad at School, Rhetorics of Mental Disability and Academic Life, was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2011, and it won the Outstanding Book Award from College Composition and Communication. With Stephanie Kirschbaum, Margaret is currently at work on a study of disabled faculty and the rhetorical experience of disclosure. She's an avid knitter, active inline skater, and likes tiny dogs. <laughs> So, very interesting speakers here. Um, Mar so, Margaret and Jim said that one of their goals for this session is to show all the various ways you can help make conference presentations more accessible. Um, so, to that end, the session is being live transcribed um, via CART, which is computer-aided real-time transcription. So, right there. Um, the session is also, if you probably picked up on this, the session is also being videotaped. Um, and after the um, after it's over, Jim and Margaret will they'll distribute a captioned version of the video. Um, they've also developed a list of questions that they're going to use to guide their conversation. So those are the questions I think everybody has in the handouts. They're also up here, um, and I believe aren't you also recording it? Okay. So and the, was that going to be passed around during question and answer? The recorder. Okay. All right. So the plan here is for Jim and Margaret to be in conversation for about 40 minutes and then to have plenty of time for us to discuss. So without further ado, let's turn it over to them. Is there anything anyone needs for access that we might provide? Okay. These in-conversation panels at RSA bring together rhetoricians from what has become in contemporary American academia the somewhat distinct traditions associated with composition and speech, or the written and the spoken. So the first question we will discuss is how do rhetoric composition and rhetoric speech approach disability studies similarly and differently? How do these traditions conceive of, study, and engage rhetorics of disability and access? Moreover, how do our different answers to this question reflect the traditions of rhetoric composition and rhetoric speech? And I'm going to start with an answer to this question, and then Margaret will take over, and then she's actually going to start the question in a second. And if there's a point in which somebody wants to jump in, um, you know, we're going to be carrying on a more open conversation afterwards, but if there's something that you really have to speak out on at that point, feel free. I'm going to begin with a quote that some of you probably have heard before. <coughs> Imagine that you enter a parlor. You come late. When you arrive, others have long preceded you, and they are engaged in a heated discussion, a discussion too heated for them to pause and tell you exactly what it is about. In fact, the discussion had already begun long before any of them got there, so that no one present is qualified to retrace for you all the steps that had gone before. You listen for a while until you decide you have caught the tenor of the argument. Then you put in your oar. 
Someone answers, you answer her, another comes to your defense, another aligns himself against you to either the embarrassment or gratification of your opponent, depending on the quality of your ally's assistance. However, the discussion is interminable. The hour grows late, you must depart. And you do depart, with the discussion still vigorously in progress. That's Kenneth Burke from the Philosophy of Literary Form, and his conversation is the conversation of academia, of knowledge of what we do as a field. I want to give you a little background then on how this particular iteration of the conversation got started. Last year at RSA, in the summer workshops that were held in Kansas, I was at, um, I was at a panel that were you know, a workshop that was organized around issues of disability and rhetoric. Um, Michael Bay Roubaix and Rachel Adams were the persons in the charge of the group, and I was one of the participants. I think we had 17 um, total uh, either faculty or students who were involved in it. And at the end of that, or somewhere near the conclusion of it, when Kendall Phillips was talking about the plan for this RSA and how we have to have these in-conversation panels, I said, well, you know, could we do one on disability? And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't you organize it? <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I'll see who I can find. And I, I asked around some people I, I knew in the area of, of, of rhetoric composition and was looking for somebody that thought would be a select, you know, somebody that would be an ideal uh, participant. And, uh, and Margaret's name came up, but she was highly recommended by a number of people and said, yes, that's perfect for what you want to do. So I asked Margaret, and she said yes. Uh, so I, I read her book, um, which I'm very glad I did because it's extremely helpful and it's not just in my own work, but also in the kinds of ideas that we're going to talk about. Um, and I really seriously do recommend that you check it out. It's, it was pretty obvious. I think I read about eight pages in when I realized that, yeah, this was what I wanted to do. This was going to work for the basis of our conversation. I often tell my students that rhetoricians are people who are conscious that we're not Platonists. And that pretty much distinguishes, maybe the only thing that distinguishes what we are. There are, I think, a lot of beliefs, at least for me, I had a lot of beliefs about the differences between rhetoric composition and rhetoric speech. And one of the things that's happened as we've talked about this conversation, which we started over the internet and um, using video chat and so forth, where we talked back and forth about the questions we would ask and things that we would say, and how we might engage them. I think I realized, and, and I think that you've agreed on this too, that we don't have quite as much that distinguishes us as we might have thought. I certainly had a lot of preconceptions and notions about how the traditions had sort of grown up differently. And so I thought it was an interesting question to say, how do we really approach disability studies differently? Right? What are the things that we do that, that separate us that are unique to one tradition or the other? And maybe you can help me come up with an answer to that question, because I, I, more and more I think the answer is, well, not really much at all. Right? There are some things that we'll point out, but these differences are almost more, they're more questions of style than any kind of a content or substance, which of course, because we're rhetoricians, means that they're also important. Style is not something we discard. But I think that the commonalities have really dominated what I see as what's important here. One of those is, I, I want to take from, from Mark's book, actually. Uh, in her conclusion, she's writing to answer the question of why do we use a rhetorical, why use rhetorical studies? And she says that um, I'm heartened by the belief that attention to rhetoric gives us opportunities to intervene in systems of oppression and change those systems for the better. And the next line is, this book is intended to begin a conversation that serves the final or authoritative word on mental disability in academia. To me, that's the most important thing that unites rhetoric and rhetoricians of all stripes. That we are interested in the power to change and the ways that we can use word to do that. A language is developing around our understanding of disability and the ways that discrimination, uh, ableist discrimination, have become a uh, what we've become aware of the depth of it, the extent to which it permeates our society, and it permeates our language, our rhetoric. It permeates the ways that we tell stories. Um, it, it permeates the ways that we consider things, like the the school shootings that. Uh, Margaret writes about a mad at school, which, as some of you probably know from earlier today, was 
uh, and a recent iteration of this has, has also just now occurred in Santa Barbara, California. Um, and, and in that story, I was noting that they were making the same sort of references. They referred to that as the work of a madman. And they referred to the person who, at this point, hasn't even been definitively identified. But they've reported and said that this, is, uh, this person was clearly mentally disturbed. And there's references to their mental state and to mental illness in just a few articles that have come out already. This is this saturates our society. And the way that we do something about this is we, we focus on the oppression, we create words. Kenneth Burke talked about neologism, right? Making new words that we can use to, to point out, to orient, to make sense out of, so that we can be able to, to think differently about ability and bodies and access. And that's, I think, the thing that we bring from both sides, right, or from, from any side in which you approach it as a rhetorical perspective. That might be what defines a rhetorical perspective, right? Words. Words matter. That's why we disagree with Plato. Right? I want to point out or suggest one difference, though. And um, actually, two. One, one I'm going to hold on to because we're going to get to it in the second question, which is the, uh, the conception of writing. Um, but one difference that I think is is worth considering is the, um, the way that, that writing, unlike speech, has, um, or I'm sorry, composition, unlike speech, writing was what we'll get to next. Composition, unlike speech, has a kind of materiality to it that speech has, I think, um, historically sort of moved away from. And it'll show up in a number of places in the conversation that I hope to have on the second question and on the third. It's, it's this idea of, the, of a kind of, of stuff, a thingness to, to words that rhetoric composition has, I think, long had a better understanding of than rhetoric speech. And it's something that rhetoric speech, as it's become more interested in cultural studies and things of this nature, has become a better um, observer of and, and understood more the power of that kind of uh, use of language. So. That's something that I think we'll come back to as a potential difference, and also the thing I think that unites us the most. Mm. But Mark, please. Um, first, I have to um, acknowledge my anxiety by doing a little paranoia check of the camera. OK. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, the conversations with Jim over the last months. and. Um, I should confess at the outset to an ignorance, which was um, an ignorance of the uh, demarcation between rhetoric composition and rhetoric speech. Um, I think that's probably just a sign of how thoroughly steeped I am in rhetoric composition that I, I wasn't really at first quite aware of what Jim was talking about <laughs> when he was saying different traditions. Um, and so this has really been an education for me. Uh, the conversations leading up to this conversation. Uh, I, I really agree um, with Jim's point that, that the, the fundamental commitment at the base of both traditions is the same. Um, and I think, although what you just said, Jim, was words matter, I think um, I'm, go I'm gonna make an assumption, which is what you meant was meaning matters. Um, meaning making practices matter because both rhetoric composition and rhetoric speech are deeply invested in meaning-making practices and the differences that they make in the world. Um, I'm also fascinated to talk more about um, the, the similar orientation of rhetoric and composition and rhetoric and speech to this question of permanence. Um, ever since I first read Walter Ong, I first read Walter Ong's book, um, Orality and Literacy, in a graduate seminar with Peter Elbow. And um, at the time, I was taking American Sign Language as one of my required languages in graduate school. Um, and I, I read Ong, and I was immediately pissed off. Um, <laughs> because he was saying these things like, orality does this, and literacy does that. And you can have multiple visual channels at the same time, but you can't have multiple oral channels. Um, and I wrote this, you know, very heated seminar paper about ASL and how it just blew on out of the water. Um, and I, I think 
you know, having now had time to reflect on that for some years, I think the similar orientations, and I think this would include on um, um, between speech and writing, or, or speech and composition, is that um, now that we live in a world that's always telepresent, T-E-L-E, -E, and the word present, um, both writing and speech are always ephemeral, but also always permanent. Um, you can no longer assume that something you say orally will sort of disappear into the ether and then become part of folkloric reproduction because you might be on camera. You know, um, there are genres like Snapchat now. Um, Snapchat is an application that creates a file, which may be visual or maybe oral or maybe both, and then um, supposedly destroys that file within a few seconds. Um, there are all these really fascinating ways in the 21st century that um, rhetoric composition and rhetoric and speech are, are not just overlapping, in a way they're sort of galloping toward each other. Um, through the, the emerging meaning-making practices. So that's all by way of saying um, it's been an incredibly rich and exciting conversation, um, especially as we've talked about the various technologies that we wanted to use to mediate this conversation. One thing that I do think is um, different between composition and speech is um, the ways that I'm, and I'm not even going to speak for the whole, the entire disciplines, because I, I absolutely can't do that. I'm going to speak only on behalf of entire conferences, which I'm also not qualified to do. <laughs> um, my experience is that 4Cs has put a lot of faith in um, the, the possibility of changing structures to, to change injustice. So in 4Cs, for example, um, starting in the late 1990s and continuing through the aughts, um, there have been, there's been a lot of labor to create um, entities like the Committee on Disability Issues, um, the Document of Policy on Disability in 4Cs, um, the Disability Special Interest Group, the mentoring program that grew out of that special interest group, um, the position of access liaison that we now have for 4Cs, and most recently, um, the scholarships for emerging scholars who are working on disability issues to come to 4Cs. Um, I think, in a way, 4Cs reminds me of a bunch of policy wonks who like gather together in the same room and they're like, we can totally improve this if we just write a better policy. <laughs> um, and so, true to form, that's what Cs people are doing, is, is working on trying to continually build a more just mousetrap, so to speak. Um, I actually am less familiar with RSA as a conference, so there may be a lot of organizing ac efforts that I am not aware of. Um, and I know um, from talking to um, Katie Pryor, for example, and um, who did we have dinner with last night? Janelle Johnson, um, that there are various organizations and groups that I would, I would be very interested to, to learn from. But when I was thinking about what distinguishes rhetoric and composition and its orientation to disability, one thing that really came to mind was um, we really want to inscribe the better world that we're trying to make. We're, we're very interested in inscribing that and distributing it and being able to point to our policies or our research in order to confront um, legislators, administrators, whoever it is that we're trying to persuade. Um, another thing that strikes me is um, the theoretical approaches within rhetoric and composition are really proliferate. Um, as often happens um, across the disciplines with disability studies, early work in composition focused on pedagogy um, and then started moving in a lot of different directions. Um, for example, Amy Vidali wrote a fantastic article for Disability Studies Quarterly called Hysterical Again, the Gastrointestinal Woman in Medical Discourse. Um, Andrew Lucchesi, uh, his last name is L-U-C-C-H-E-S-I, um, is working on um, modes of using big data to study disability issues, um, and specifically disability service providers at universities. Um, Robert McRuer, who I'm sure most people are familiar with his book, Crip Theory, um, explores um, decomposition through a lens of queer theory and philosophy. Um, and Allison Hitt is um, looking at ways that new media can infuse our, infuse our knowledge of disability. 
One thing that has not been done, though, and that Jim has done um, in an article, for again, for Disability Studies Quarterly, is to turn and study ableism directly. Um, this is the move to study ableism rather than disability um, is something that I think critical disability scholars are very familiar with. Um, Fiona Kumari Campbell, sorry, her name is not on your list. Her middle name is K-U-M-A-R-I. It's Fiona Kumari Campbell. Um, Fiona Kumari Campbell wrote a book um, that focuses specifically on ableism, and this is a move that I think we're becoming an increasingly familiar with um, through scholars, particularly in New Zealand and the UK and Canada. Um, and another work that should be mentioned here is Jay Dolmage's <coughs> disability rhetoric. Um, so an interesting thing that I noticed in Jim's work, and I, I don't think we can take your work as, as sort of representative of all of rhetoric speech, uh, but I do think the move you made in your article for Disability Studies Quarterly and the move you're making in your book to focus specifically on the rhetoric of ableism itself um, is an interesting move and one that I think would be an interesting direction for rhetoric composition to go in. Um, I'm going to move us on now to our second question. Uh, Jim and I got talking, when we were sort of trying to talk about what we thought of disability rhetoric, uh, we ended up talking a lot about what we considered texts. Um, in the introduction to Mad at School, there's a photograph of a page of notes that I took. Um, and it's, it's the page of notes that impelled me eventually to actually write the book. Um, it's sort of this scribbly um, document that says, um, boy, we, we really need a book about mental, mental illness and rhetoric. We, we should have that book. And then it goes on for like a page in green ink. Actually, green and purple ink. Um, because first I took the, the notes in, I think, green ink, and then I later added some thoughts in purple. And this sort of moment, as inscribed on, right, on paper, seemed to me incredibly significant. Um, and I was uh, very invested in the bricolage of it, um, B-R-I-C-O-L-A-G-E. Um, the way that there was an initial thought, and then the thought was written over by my later thoughts. And um, then that, that, um, that moment in time, um, came to seem so significant me as, as this kind of um, origin story, this, this inception moment for the book. Um, and when Jim and I talked about that, um, I don't remember the exact context for what we were talking about, but I was saying something like, oh, you should reproduce those notes you were taking. You know, that's really important. It's so important to sort of grasp that moment. And as I recall anyway, your reaction was, well, that's not really what I'm eventually going to say. Um, and I was thinking, but that's an archive. Um, and so again, I wouldn't want to make the, the argument that we have these radically different approaches to texts, but that we may possibly look at similar texts and pick out different things as being interesting or significant. Um, and I've been talking for a minute, so I'm going to um, pause there and, and turn the second question over to Jim. Yeah, the, I think the tradition of, of, of text and speech in that side of, of the area, has often ignored writing, or at least only seen writing as a kind of mechanism to record, right? That the, the written, and that was, I think, part of what the response that I had to the, the, the page that, that uh, we're talking about that appears in the book was, I, I was really impressed. I was really sort of, it, what, I, what caught my eye, but I'd never seen anything like that. And it really, um, it shaped my response to the book. It shaped what I thought about Margaret. It, it was, it really was an intense kind of experience. And I think what I said actually that started the whole thing or the conversation about that is, wow, I wish I could do that. Um, yes, and I, that's right. And, and, and actually, I was like, you can. You know, I'm such a writing teacher. You can totally do it. <laughs> and, and my answer was, no, no. You should see what my notes look like. Um, I mean, because hers are legible and, and mine aren't. Um, it's fairly simple. Uh, no, the uh, but to but to me, I think it was an assumption, and this reflects the way that I was thinking about my notes. That they're just a way of they're not meaningful as uh, iterations, as um, inscriptions of what it is that um, that I'm doing, and it's something that I've become more aware of. I'm a graduate student now. Um, I'm on his committee at Wayne State, and he's working on what he calls the hieroglyphic style. And so looking at, at hieroglyphics and the ways that literally the work of writing itself has come to influence the stylistic impact of, of what the rhetoric does, 
um, and how it operates. And I think it's something that I, like I said, it's something that I'm becoming more aware of, but I think that the tradition that I've been brought up in doesn't pay as much attention to. Um, now, something that we did mention at one point that would be interesting to talk about maybe further is Plato's critique of writing, right? That, that part where he sort of describes the, the problems of writing, and of course, he, it's written down, so it's all sort of you know, inherently paradoxical and ironic. Um, and I think that the, um, it's, that reflects one of the, the well, it's, it's one of those things where you sort of see a different kind of sensibility, I think, between the way that I was raised to think about it from my tradition and the ways that I've heard people from composition talk about that same, you know, that, that same moment in Plato's work. Um, I don't want to keep talking about Plato. That's, that's, that's the wrong direction entirely. Um, I was thinking, though, when you were talking about inscription, and, and the other thing about writing that I guess I'd like to say is that the... It's funny because the thing I can think of that's closest to what you were saying was something that um, Professor Bob Ivey, who was one of my um, instructors in graduate school uh, at Indiana University, was describing essentially the same thing. And he said, and this is a direct quote because I've memorized it, we need to start writing the world the way that we want it to be. And that's, that's what he saw as the rhetoric, the mandate for rhetoric. That we needed to write the world the way we want it to be. And, and it wasn't until you were saying it just now that I realized that he's using the word right. Mm -hmm. To me, I never thought about that until this very moment. That to me, he was saying, we need to say the world would, would, that we want it to be. We, we need to you know, construct it. We need to, to build it. But the writing is, is there. It's, just, it's something that I, I think we just we don't look at it. It's to... It's something that we don't really, that I'm saying we, I really, again, I shouldn't be trying to represent the field. It's something that I don't think about until something like the page in your book just hits it, you know, and then it's like, wow, yeah. That's something that I've been ignoring and, and shouldn't. So. I'm going to, actually, before we go to three, do you mind if I add something about text? Go ahead. Um, there's another thing that I'm, I'm really interested in that I think... Um, well, I don't know if it's particularly significant in regard to the, the composition and speech traditions, but it's really important, I think, in disability studies, and particularly those who are interested in meaning-making practices around disability, it's just unavoidable to think about the body as text mm -hmm. um, in, in, both our, in both our traditions, to some degree across the disciplines, I think, but I think that um, rhetoric has a really particular purchase on the notion of the body as text. Um, I'm very invested in thinking about bodies and minds not being separated. Um, I've been working with a word, a single word, body-mind, without a space in the middle, um, for some time. And I, I just wrote an article recently where I think I finally managed to have arrived at some sort of theorization of what I actually mean by that. Um, I think something that um, is is unavoidable in in both composition and in speech is what are we going to do with the mind? Um, and the mind has been a, a topic of intense interest, of course, since before Plato. Um, it's gone by by many names, um, and it's it's one of those entities like sexuality, when where when you try to historicize it, it, it gets very fuzzy what you're actually pointing to, you know, were they actually talking about the mind? Um, and today, of course, we, we tend to conflate the mind and the brain. Um, and there are some really interesting traditions, specifically in rhetoric, such as neuro-rhetorics, um, which are, are looking very, in very interesting and very nuanced ways at discourses around the brain. Um, so I guess I just want to mark that um, in regard to the meaning of text in rhetorical studies, um, I think body as text and texts around and on the body um, are, are of increasing importance in rhetoric. And I, I think in, in some new ways that have not necessarily been already kind of tromped into the ground by feminist theory and queer theory. <laughs> I, think, I think rhetoric has some really new and, and interesting things to add to the mix, which maybe we can talk about more during mm -hmm. the, the more open discussion. Well, let me use that as a segue then to the, the, the third question. Um, to read it, the third question we were going to talk about is how do the two traditions differ 
in their view of rhetoric's classical roots, and what are the implications of these differences for rhetoric's role in disability and access. And um, the inspiration for me in, in bringing this question up, this is a question that I, I thought that we should talk about, is, uh, is actually conversations that I had with Jay Tomich when we were at Miami University, and in the work that Jay was doing on Mady and, and on the, the various types of um, the classical sources that he and I had both read, but very much, I mean, very, we'd read very differently. And at least it, I got the sense in reading that, you know, he read something other than what I read, that um, I really hadn't looked at them in the same kind of way. And, and I think that's maybe one of the places where there is something that, uh, a kind of set of differences that we can uh, engage, because I think that, at least when I was taught classical rhetoric, I was taught it by a particular person who is teaching it from a particular perspective, and that's the perspective that when I teach classical rhetoric, that's what I'm teaching, and it's one that, you know, will get handed down from me on to the next generation, and so on. And, um, and so looking back at the classical roots and the ways that we understand those, these are texts that have stood the test of time. Right? They, they've influenced much more than, than just contemporary Western culture. Um, and they also are, in, in many ways, um, they're things that we don't own. Right, but neither neither the contemporary speech tradition or the contemporary composition tradition can say these are ours, um, in part because they, they, you know, none of us use the languages that they were originally written in, and um, and they're very, you know, they're they're very much things that have been um, translated and and have been modified to some extent over time. 